I'm Alan Auerbach, and uh, this is a panel on fiscal re realities, Kevin, uh, California's revenue volatility. Uh, I guess it's the nature of, of the um, uh, thing we're talking about that we tend to focus on it more when revenue goes down than when revenue goes up. Uh, during the uh, fiscal crisis that began in 2008, uh, there was a lot of attention paid to the volatility of California's uh, revenue system. Um, and some people, of course, are still paying attention to it, and that's uh, why we're here to talk about it. Uh, but no doubt, if, if uh, nothing changes, uh, then the next time there's a serious recession, we're going to, everybody in the state's going to be talking about it again. So we're going to try to anticipate some of that discussion with our expert panel today, talking about uh, the nature of the problem, California's, uh, the, the, the uh, volatility of our uh, state and local revenues, uh, what is being done about it, uh, what could be done about it uh, through uh, various policy changes uh, and the problems that are associated uh, with this volatility. Uh, we have an expert panel, as I said. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of each of them now uh, so that I don't have to interrupt the flow of the um, presentations once we get started. And I'll just say that I'm going to ask each one of our three panelists to talk for about 10 minutes, which will leave us time uh, first to have uh, members of the panel react to each other's presentations, maybe have me uh, raise a question based on what they've said, uh, and then we should still have time to open uh, the discussion to the floor for questions. Our first speaker to my immediate right is Ann Hollingshead, who's a senior fiscal policy analyst, a fiscal and policy analyst, excuse me, uh, with the Legislative Analyst's Office. Uh, she covers the overall condition of the state budget, federal funding to the state, and wage and salary issues. And she holds an MPP from the Goldman School of Public Policy at uh, UC Berkeley, so we know she's well trained. Uh, to her right is Patrick Murphy. He's a director of research and a senior fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California, where he holds the Thomas C. Sutton Chair in Policy Research. His own research focuses on financing and management in both K-12 and higher education. He holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and a, a Master's in Public Affairs from the University of Texas at Austin. And to his right is Gabriel Pettick, who, CFA, who's Managing Director uh, in the U.S. States Group of the U.S. Public Finance Division of Standard & Poor's Global Ratings in San Francisco. He's S&P's Global Ratings Primary Analyst for the states of California and Illinois. So I guess he'll, he's here to tell us that it could be worse. Uh, he holds a, uh, an MPP uh, from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. So with that, I will talk no longer at this moment and ask Anne to give her presentation. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to start with a broad overview of revenue volatility <clears throat> excuse me, in the state. Um, and then I'll talk about Proposition 2, which is the main way that California has uh, chosen to address revenue volatility in recent years. Okay. So just to start with a little context, um, the personal income tax is the dominant state revenue source for California. It makes up about 70% of general fund revenues. It's much bigger than the sales and use tax and, and corporate tax in percentage terms. Um, although this hasn't always been the case. Uh, the personal income tax has been rising over the last few decades as a share of general fund tax revenues. You would generally expect um, any revenue source to fluctuate in response to economic changes, right? So, you know, even if your state is generally reliant on sales taxes, when people buy more stuff, when they have more money, revenues would go up and they buy less stuff and revenues would go down. But we find that the personal income tax is particularly 
uh, responsive to changes in the economy relative to other taxes. So this graphic shows percent changes year to year in the personal income tax versus personal income, which is one broad measure of economic activity. And as you can see, personal income tax itself is much, much more responsive to these changes in, in recessions um, than the personal income. <clears throat> There are three basic reasons that this is the case. Uh, the first is the way that the state defines the base of taxation for PIT. So um, in particular, the state of California taxes capital gains revenues like their regular income. Um, and that means that capital gains revenues, which come from a pretty volatile underlying source, the stock market, which can go up and down, um, are very volatile themselves. So that's the first sort of biggest reason. The second reason is that the PIT is taxed on a progressive rate structure, meaning that higher income earners pay higher rates than lower income earners. And higher income earners also have uh, much more volatility underlying in their, in their incomes. So this graph shows those earners, uh, volatility among those owners with uh, more than $150,000 a year versus those with less than $150,000 in earnings per year. So obviously a progressive rate structure is going to exacerbate this underlying volatility. Uh, finally, and the, the sort of smallest reason is that there are a variety of credits and deductions um, that largely disproportionately benefit uh, lower and middle income earners. And again, that would tend to exacerbate revenue volatility. So there are two, um, well actually before I say that, the problem with revenue volatility in case it's not obvious is that if revenues go up and down from year to year, uh, the state can't really respond by just drastically cutting spending from year to year. So there are two basic ways that you can deal with this issue, right? One, you can reform the underlying tax structure. You could depend more on more stable revenue sources, maybe more sales taxes, uh, eliminate the progressive rate structure, tax capital gains differently. Um, but the second way would be budget reserves. And this is the way that the state has clear, this is the direction that the state has clearly moved um, in recent years. So voters passed Proposition 2 in 2014, and Proposition 2 changed state budgetary practices in two basic ways. First, it requires the state to set aside minimum annual amounts toward paying down certain eligible debts, including pension liabilities. And second, it requires the state to set aside minimum annual amounts in the state's rainy day fund, or budget stabilization account. So that uh, those two minimum annual amounts are determined through a formula. I'll talk about the specifics of the formula in a minute, um, but just sort of conceptually, Proposition 2 sets aside a base amount each year, just a flat amount of general fund revenues each year. And then second, it sets aside what's called excess capital gains. And the idea behind excess capital gains is that we set aside monies when revenues are peaking, when the stock market is high, when capital gains revenues are high, and then we use those monies later uh, when, when revenues are low. So, okay, so I'm going to show you just sort of schematically how Proposition 2 works because it's pretty complicated, but it's also, I think, pretty interesting. So we start with a measure of total general fund revenues, and we set aside 1.5% of that total. That 1.5% is split half toward paying down eligible debts and half toward state reserves. The second part of the calculation is excess capital gains. So for that, we start with tax revenue, uh, general fund tax revenue, which is a subset of general fund revenue. Um, and we measure 8% of those total revenues. You can think of that as like a historical average where capital gains revenues tend to lie. So the amount above that historical average that we get from capital gains is what we would call excess capital gains, the amount above the historical average. And we set aside half of that excess into debt and then half of that excess into reserves. Now the state makes this determination uh, prior to the fiscal year commencing. So right now the state is considering the 2018-19 budget that will begin on July 1st and end June 30th. Um, but in order to pass a budget and to do this calculation, the legislature needs to make a determination of what's going to happen with the stock market between July 1st and June 30th of next year. As no one knows what will happen with the stock market between those dates, otherwise they would be very rich, um, the state has to revisit its, uh, its estimate of capital gains revenues. So it does this twice in each two subsequent fiscal years. And using this updated estimate, the state says, OK, well, how much actually were capital gains revenues? If they were greater than our initial estimate, then that entire amount it goes to reserves. Uh, 
or if they were less than that initial estimate, then we would actually reduce reserves to compensate the state for the total calculation. This happens twice. Okay, so I'll just wrap up by talking about how, in general, we think this has affected um, state reserve balances. This graph shows um, total reserve balances since the early 1980s as a percent of general fund revenue and transfer to kind of give it some standardization. The last bar in dark blue is the governor's proposed level for the 2018-19 budget. And as you can see, the legislature generally enacted reserve levels that were below 5% for these decades. Uh, but in the last few years, the legislature has enacted reserve levels that are quite a bit higher. We would say that this is partly uh, a result of Proposition 2 and its ability to capitalize on really strong revenue growth in the state, and then also partly a reflection of changed budgetary practices, which I think are two issues that Gabe is going to address. That's it. I'm wise enough to let you do this. Good morning. And I want to express my thanks to the Goldman School for inviting me. I appreciate the chance to, to talk about these issues that I think are important as well and, and hopefully add a little bit to it. Um, and Anna's very nicely covered what I had hoped she would cover because my, what I would like to speak about today is intended to be a complement to that. Um, when we talk about revenue volatility in the state of California, the personal income tax just leaps out at folks and that nice jagged line is, is hopefully um, if it doesn't, didn't come to mind before walking to that room, that's the vision that I hope you'll have. Um, what I wanted to, to offer is this idea that, um, but it's almost like the infomercial, right? But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, in terms of the, the looking forward at the horizon, um, to note that, that there's a change that has taken place. Um, and that change is, is if you will, the fact that in the past, I think it's been easy to take for granted, as it were, the money the state receives from the federal government, um, in part because uh, federal government can run deficits, state governments can't, so that there's that notion of it being rather steady. And then just this idea that given that I'm here being hosted by the Goldman School, I cannot resist by noting that in general, budgeting is incremental. Um, and so given that what we got last year pretty much would suggest, at least from the federal government, what we can expect to get next year. Um, budgeters maybe often don't like to admit this, but in fact, in some cases, it's not that hard. It's going to be somewhere between 95% and 105% um, from year to year. And I would argue that um, elections have consequences, and the 2016 election means that maybe that doesn't hold, or at least as sort of comfortable as we've been in the past with regard to what to expect from the federal government. Um, in terms of the state uh, doesn't hold for the future. And to just put it in a ballpark, I think the, the, the current budget estimates about $100 billion from the federal government, a little bit more compared to, to the general fund of about $125 billion. So um, as it were, as they say, we're talking real money. Um, I apologize for mixing sources and things. This comes from the, the census government. This is money that comes to California to state and local governments. Um, I want to focus on sort of the, the usual situation, that sort of flat section there, that's 2000 to 2008, you know, hovering around 60, 70 billion dollars. The hump you see is, is the stimulus money that came in during the recession. California's revenues, personal income tax and others go down. The federal government was able to step up and at least sort of dampen some of that impact um, in, in spent deficit spent to do it, but they were able to do that because of their nature. And then that kick up at the end is what I would argue is us heading to a new plateau. Um, it's uh, affordable care kicking in and, and more money coming from the federal government for that. But going forward under what you know, used to be whatever normal was, but anyway, normal circumstances, I would expect that to plateau going forward after that. Um, as we know, that isn't the case. Um, we have a, a, a new party in the White House. Um, we have Republicans in, in control of the House and the Senate. And they've talked a lot about changing things. <coughs> And our poster child for this uncertainty, as I describe it, is Medi-Cal. Um, the Medi-Cal program a couple of years ago 
uh, about two thirds from the federal government, that uh, absolute amount is growing, um, $67 billion. The state general fund is, is no small share of this, right? Uh, uh, almost $20 billion there, and then some other sources of money. Um, going forward, even projecting for Medi-Cal, we know that we've got some issues with rising costs, increased demands on it, and some funds that are coming from that other spot that are somewhat temporary, or not temporary, but have a, a sunset on them that uh, say if you were writing a report, which we were, the, that came in in the first draft the first week of November, um, and we projected somewhere in the area of a couple billion dollars that we were gonna be short, and that was an issue, and we were gonna have to try to figure out a way to find that. Um, that draft came in on a Monday. There was an election on the Tuesday of 2016, and all of a sudden our $2 billion problem might be as much as a $20 billion problem um, if they were to repeal affordable care. And so my point here is not just the rehashing the nightmare that has been around whether or not there's going to be affordable care or not, but just the magnitude of that impact and what it could mean for the state of California. Medi-Cal isn't the only program that has a big chunk of money coming from federal funds. Transportation, we've got about $5 billion, Department of Labor and, and Workforce, $7 billion. Um, K through 12 education, it's a small relative share, but it's still $7 billion, $8 billion. And the other spot, like Medi-Cal, that's part of our social safety net, the Department of Social Services, maybe another $8 billion. Um, in particularly Department of Social Service, we've had sort of discussions, or at least uh, legislation that's either been drafted or proposed that has suggested possible changes to these programs as well, and what would come to California. Um, in the so what, what does this mean? I feel incumbent to not just talk about numbers, but to try to bring it home a little bit. This is work that Caroline Danielson and Sarah Bone at PPIC have done um, using the California Poverty Measure. The California Poverty Measure is a project with PPIC and Stanford, but what we try to do is provide a, a, a better reflection of, of true poverty in California than the federal poverty measure gives us. Um, the dark part of these bars is where poverty is in California. The piece above it is where it would be without the social safety net programs. Um, so we're talking CalFresh, CalWorks, et cetera. And as you see, we jump, that rate jumps significantly for all residents, uh, easiest to focus on children, it jumps 14.5% without those social safety net programs. CalFresh alone, SNAP, uh, food stamps, um, moves 800,000 California residents out of poverty. Uh, by the California Poverty Measure, um, and also as part of the Ag Bill that's being talked about now. Um, those programs that we focus on are counter-cyclical, of course, and the challenge with that is that when we hit an economic downturn and, and, and look forward to whenever that recession is or, or will come, um, which I do believe it will, the demand for those services will go up, the cost to the state will go up, and as I say, in the past, we've relied upon the federal government to kind of increase its share and be able to fill some of that gap. Not clear that's going to be the case. So then we'll be faced with some pretty difficult options. Do we reduce benefits? Do we reduce the eligibility overall? Or do we find new revenue sources? And of course, finding new revenue in a recession is tough. Um, I've looked through other parts. I'm a former federal budget person. Um, are there other elements of federal po fiscal po policy that may offset some of this? Um, we're certainly looking at spending a lot more in defense spending. Um, back in the 80s and 90s in the heyday, that really was great for California because we were really invested in the defense industry. We had a lot of bases here. Um, as, as most of you know, that isn't the case now. So I don't look to that to provide the boost that it used to. Um, we've got a lot more deficit spending. That means a lot more federal borrowing. Um, the state and local governments are going to probably pay, pay higher prices for that. And I'll leave that as a transition to my next speaker, the next speaker. Um, it's already been touched on. Bill talked about the and, and Sarah the, the federal uncertainty regarding the, the personal income tax changes that have been made and the corporate income tax at the federal level. And then I can't resist one of my favorite topics. Even acts by the federal government are threatening the about a billion dollars we could expect to come in for, for state revenues from cannabis sales. Um, so bottom line, we've got federal action that could lead to major shifts in these programs. It creates a great deal of uncertainty. Um, looking forward at a possible recession, we can't necessarily count on the federal government to dampen that effect, and the impact's going to probably fall on the, the, the poorest Californians. So I uh, apologize for the kind of Debbie Downer approach, but 
um, reality of what we're looking at. So thank you. <laughs> there it is. That's right. I, I hope it would be <coughs> the uh, PDF one. Thank you. Let's see what it is. Without cutting oh. that off there. <coughs> that, that was okay. How you That's not working. That's fine. Uh, that's fine. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noah. Um, so, and Patrick, that gives me the rare opportunity to not be the uh, most pessimistic one on the panel. So that's my goal. That's great. Um, okay. I actually uh, would just remind everyone that I come from a rating agency, and so my name is Gabe Pettick. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, but I work for uh, S&P Global Ratings, and we uh, assign credit ratings to states and local governments in, in our public finance division. And so I work in our states group, and the um, states group tends to uh, assign high ratings to state governments. For the most part, the states are uh, very credit worthy, as Bill was talking about in his uh, opening discussion. Uh, the states have uh, the, they enjoy sovereignty over the design of their fiscal structures. That gives them a lot of discretion to, over how much uh, to tax their residents and how, what level of services to provide. And you see a wide variation along those lines reflecting the political culture of each state. The, the, the states also benefit from their, uh, traditionally, they've benefited from their uh, integration with the federal government in the sense that the, they, they operate with uh, fiscal constraints, but the federal government has had set up programs that provide counter-cyclical funding to the states. And we have uh, viewed that favorably over time. And uh, then the third thing is really that many of the states have developed uh, what, you would con what we consider cons uh, a conservative credit culture in the sense that uh, most of them have uh, balanced budget requirements. They have certain constraints about how much debt they can issue. Many states have constraints on um, the use of debt, restricting it for capital projects as opposed to funding ongoing uh, costs, like uh, Bill mentioned that as well. Those uh, policies, in many cases, though, were set up early to the middle of the prior century, and I think you could sort of construct an argument that some of the policies are due for a refresh in our new economy. And so despite those advantages that I've highlighted, the states are uh, actually under a considerable amount of fiscal pressure. And uh, we think this is a function of maybe three things. The, and we've been doing a lot of research in this area about the economy with our chief economist. Uh, there are the ideas about what's going on with the economy, but the U.S. economy has only averaged 1.9% real GDP growth in the, in the recovery since the Great Recession. But if you look over the period from 1950 through the present, the economy has averaged 3.2% growth. So what's going on? Why is the economy slower? The second thing is that whatever growth we are seeing, the state tax systems are... Uh, levied against a smaller share of the economy. And that's because I think it maybe is tied to one of Ann's slides, but the sales taxes in most states, for example, 
are levied against uh, the trade or uh, exchange for tangible goods and not so much for the services. And the service sectors have been the, the growing part of state economies. So as that has grown, the sales taxes are applied to a smaller share of overall economic activity. And this slide just shows state tax revenues in the aggregate indexed to uh, the beginning of the past four recessions. And you see that the most recent recession had the slowest recovery. And actually, each of the past four recessions has grown successive, successively slower in terms of recovery. So it suggests there's something structural going on. <clears throat> And, and we think that's um, putting pressure on state finances. Uh, the other item is then this issue of the entitlements and Medicaid, which we always, you know, the states are co-financers of the Medicaid pro of Medicaid, which is a countercyclical, uh, countercyclical um, entitlement program where enrollment and demand for the services go up right when tax revenues go down. So from an institutional standpoint, the states are not really well designed to be co-financers of a program like that. But you know, they do get a lot of uh, federal inflows uh, through the program that helps um, it act, you know, provide some counter-cyclical funding into state economies and helps alleviate some of the pressure on budgets. And importantly, in the last two recessions, the federal government provided enhanced aid for Medicaid, enhanced funding for Medicaid. It's uh, not our view. We, our view is that that would be unlikely to happen under the current um, political uh, arrangement in Washington. So, if we had a recession, but this slide just shows that the Medicaid costs are growing much faster than state tax revenues. They talk about. The economists talk about Belmel's cost disease, and um, the states are funders of things like healthcare and education, where productivity gains are not um, as easy to achieve. And so, the inflationary pressures in these uh, in these areas, which are very significant in state budgets, outpaces inflation more broadly. And you can see the pressure that that would be that puts on state finances. And uh, I'm going to move past that one. And this I just wanted to show. This shows um, state fixed costs, which is pension contributions, retiree health care benefits, debt service, and then we added uh, state general fund Medicaid uh, spending. So this is just more or less the less discretionary components of state budgets. And the median of this, it comes out to 28% of state expenditures. But it ranges from at the at the far end. It goes. It's above forty percent in states like Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Illinois, and down at the at the other end, Utah, Oregon, Wyoming, it's less than fifteen percent. The median is about twenty-eight to thirty percent, and actually, California is right in that range. So all of these pressures have been putting downward pressure on state credit ratings. Over the last two years, there have been 17 downgrades and just two upgrades. Uh, the state credit distribution remains high. Most of the ratings are uh, AA category, which we consider very strong. And uh, California is a little below average at AA minus for many of the reasons we've been discussing here today about the volatility. Now, California has actually bucked this trend of pressure that I've been mentioning about the whole sector. The state has seen its uh, uh, economy grow at a faster rate than the nation, 2.8% throughout the recovery, almost a full percentage point faster than the nation as a whole. But of course, this wasn't always the case. Coming into the recession, the state's uh, general fund, fund balance was more than 25% of expenditures in the red, negative. And so putting together this uh, recovery that we've seen has been a combination of faster economic growth and faster revenue growth than the average state. We think that it has, uh, there's more to the story though than just the faster revenue growth. And that is actually a good time for me to compare Illinois to California. Illinois is a state that also passed a temporary tax increase in uh, 2011. And they came into 
the post-recession years having accumulated $8 billion in unpaid bills. That was about 22% of their budget. And you may remember the term, the wall of debt. And when California came out of the recession, it had accumulated almost $35 billion in deferrals and various internal loans and debts that, were, that it had used to patch together its recurring budget deficits. So from that standpoint, they were similar. That was, more, that was actually a higher level of budgetary debt than Illinois had. Now, the difference is, uh, since then, Illinois' budgetary debts went from $8 billion to over $16 billion throughout the, the subsequent years. California, on the other hand, has almost eliminated those, that wall of debt, if you want to call it their budgetary debts. So that very negative fund balance position that you see here has um, largely reversed. So I like to, I'm a fan of the LAO does a, uh, every fall, a fiscal forecast. And it's a multiple year look at the trajectory of state revenues and expenditures. And I'm a fan of that document. It's um, very useful for our work. And what it showed, I, I went back to the 2010 forecast, and this is what the, gen the LAO said general funds were on that blue line trajectory. But then uh, Governor Brown took office and they brought down the expenditure trajectory. And you can see that in the green and red lines. So the key to it from our standpoint was that the, the changes they, they put into the budget were, had ongoing benefit. They were things like public safety realignment uh, and um, uh, the, um, what am I trying to blank? The, uh, yeah, redevelopment agencies, elimination of redevelopment, where they uh, saved basically general fund uh, re uh, funding that otherwise went to the Prop 98 uh, minimum guarantee for education and put more of, the, more of that funding was coming from local property tax bases. So by 2016, this uh, spending line in actual expenditures was 11.6 billion below what the LAO projected in 2010. Now, on the revenue side, of course, revenues are higher than what the LAO projected in 2010. I can, you know, compliment the LAO on the in the sense that uh, the revenue performance was very close to actual, what the LAO projected, uh, it was very close to the actual performance if you strip out Proposition 30. And of course, in November of 2010, the LAO couldn't take into account the benefits of Prop 30 in the revenue base because that wasn't passed until 2012. So anyway, the uh, higher revenues here in, by 2016 accounted for $9.3 billion in revenue above what that forecast showed. And in late 2010, the LAO was projecting a $20 billion structural deficit. So with $9.3 billion more in revenue and $11.6 billion in less in spending, you can see how the state has put together a balanced budget. And actually, it might even be better than that because much of the additional revenue went toward one-time expenditures in these years, paying back the deferrals for the schools that they had accumulated, paying back the economic recovery bonds uh, on an accelerated basis, and reversing a lot of this wall of debt. And that's why since 2012, now the green bars just show an improvement in the negative fund balance position of the state in its general fund. And it also, on a cash basis of accounting, as we've been talking about here today, they've accumulated this large uh, budget reserve. and had a very nice graph going back further than this. But this just highlights the improvement since the, since the Great Recession. And putting these funds in here is another way that the state used a lot of this strong revenue growth during the good times to accumulate a budget uh, reserve. So our view is just that the state has done a very good job in terms of budget management, putting together, assembling a fiscal recovery, and it's improved its credit rating. Although the credit rating remains below average for states because of its large um, uh, legacy liabilities related to retiree health care, which is 91 billion, 
uh, and large, un, you know, still large uh, liabilities related to pensions, uh, deferred maintenance on its infrastructure, and those types of things. And you couple that with its revenue volatility, which in our assessment, we've done a stress analysis of all the states and California's sensitivity to e uh, d decline in economic conditions is, is uh, significantly greater than most states. And so that makes the state vulnerable to an economic downturn. Okay, so with that, I'll... Thank you all for uh, very interesting presentations. Um, before I uh, turn it up to questions from the floor, I wanted to ask the panel a couple of questions. Uh, there's a, microphones in front of you. You can just uh, hit uh, the front to turn them on. Um, the first question I have is that we, we've been talking about uh, revenue volatility for a long time in California. And I think we understand the nature of it. It's been, uh, it's come up already in our discussion. The personal income tax is very progressive and, and so it depends a lot on incomes at the top, which uh, particularly with respect to capital gains tend to be quite volatile. Um, the sales tax, is, which is a more stable source of revenue, is also becoming less important, uh, as was already mentioned. Um, and California as a state, uh, largely as a result of Proposition 13, relies more heavily on state-level financing relative to local financing than is true in other states. And property taxes, because their taxes on, because of the way they're administered, typically also tend to be smoother than, uh, than uh, state-level taxes. Um, so that, that's the state of play. Uh, we have Proposition 2 to try to uh, 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 smooth out the fluctuations in revenue, at least in terms of the government's budget. Uh, but we haven't said anything about uh, what might be done to the tax system itself. So here's a conundrum for you, and you can feel free to pass if, if you don't uh, have anything you want to uh, say on this. But um, is there a way of changing California's tax system, taking account of the inviolability of political inviolability of Proposition 13, uh, and so and and the need desire to maintain a certain degree of progressivity in the tax system? Is there a way of of reforming California's tax system to make it less volatile? I would um, say, if anything, voters in recent years have made California's tax system more volatile. Um, so Proposition 30, which was passed in 2012, uh, enacted higher temporary um, tax increases on higher income earners. And then Proposition 55 in 2016 extended those until 2030. Um, so I don't actually have a specific answer for you, but if anything, um, the state has certainly seen more volatility in recent years um, in the underlying pet structure than, than less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we've written about um, that as well, that we think, if anything, the state has gone in the other direction. And I think another challenge that the state has is the cost of living is very high, and so uh, even though the state's uh, per capita income is 116% of the U.S., it's, it's skewed at the high end. And so the high cost of living makes it a uh, difficult place to live for people on lower incomes. And so, you know, changing it in the other direction entails probably some difficult policy trade-offs and hard political questions, and it's unclear, you know, that's... That's a, something that the political system would have to confront. And so at the risk of being the most optimistic then, um, it hasn't been, it, it doesn't mean it's not impossible to, to change some of these things. Politically, yes, there are huge barriers in front of it, Prop 13 being, you know, whatever, third rail, if you will. But there are folks discussing possible ways to tweak around there. The other point I would, would offer is the fact that we just had a massive change in the federal tax uh, uh, federal tax code for both personal income and corporate income. Um, how California chooses to align its own tax codes to that presents a possible opportunity. 
Um, it would not be necessarily popular, but a chance at which maybe you could broaden some of that and, and take out some of the reliance at the very top earners in the state um, without necessarily, in a sense, you'd be taking some of the money that was, as it were, given back as a tax break to both individuals and corporations and having the state, as it were, take a cut of that so that they don't realize as much of a, of a reduction in their tax burden. So. Um, that leads into the next question I was going to ask, which is um, uh, you were just talking about the potential state response sort of in terms of what, what it might want to do in, in response to the, fe the federal tax changes, which of course is always a question when, particularly given that tax systems tend to start with the federal uh, mm -hmm. tax system and then uh, decide what, uh, how they want to vary from that. Um, but given the very important change involving the now limited deductibility of state and local taxes, um, which is you know, a, li a limit of $10,000 for, for very many people in California is going to be well below what they would have taken as itemized deductions. Um, what do you see? I mean, there's a, that, that people have suggested that there might be obvious pressure uh, on states, uh, particularly states with high income taxes, uh, to modify their tax system. Uh, do you see that as a as a serious possibility, or uh, is it, is California simply in a place where it has to continue to rely on a very progressive income tax because it doesn't have other alternatives? I I, I see it as as if nothing else, a, a decision point. I mean, they're, they're folks, uh, something of a wake-up call. California has been very willing to tax itself, both at the state and local level, and I think the, the deductibility makes that that much harder, and people are going to have to look very hard at it. Um, if, if we look for here in Northern California, in particular, to just take a simple thing, um, our K-12 schools are much more aggressive about using something called a parcel tax, which is a way in which you can sort of tax your own property above, because Prop 13 limits what you can do. Um, when those are on the ballot in Northern California in particular, they pass. Um, that would go on your property tax bill and you could deduct it. That When that goes on the ballot again in these areas, I wonder if folks aren't going to look harder. So it certainly has increased um, pressure, and a lot of times increased pressure leads to, to decisions being made. But I don't, my crystal ball's really cloudy other than that. So. Either of you others have crystal ball? No. 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 <laughs> I, we're aware some other states, New York State, is pursuing this idea of a payroll tax to replace the income tax and coupling that with a charitable donation. But there are some implement questions around the uh, ability to implement that and, uh, and um, even uh, questions as to whether the IRS would accept the charitable donation as a true donation. <laughs> so I think there are some uh, very significant questions about it, at least. But you know, I think there are states looking into this. I think uh, just to uh, step outside of my role as moderator here, I'll just uh, register myself as a skeptic on whether the IRS would uh, allow California to make all of its uh, income tax deductible again. Um, OK, uh, those were the questions I wanted to lead off with. Uh, at this point, we have a few minutes left, and I'd be happy to, uh, I'm sure the panel would also entertain questions from the floor. Questions for Gabe. Uh, so um, California is currently rated AA minus, um, a short guarantee and Build America Mutual are both rated double A, which would suggest that California could theoretically reduce its bond financing costs by getting insurance from one of those two. Given the fact that um, monoline bond insurers collapsed during the 2008 Great Recession, and given the fact that Assured Guarantee has a lot of exposure to Puerto Rico, does that alignment of credit ratings make sense to you? Well. Uh, we, I don't, uh, you know, we do have what we strive for is a global scale where there's comparability across sectors, but um, we do implement that through the application of sector-specific rating criteria. And so um, I, I don't know if I have, uh, you know, you know I, I think it's not, a, um, it's not a question that I can... Uh, delve into the details here. I don't, I don't have, I haven't uh, done the credit analysis of those entities, but 
Okay. Yep. I, this question is for Gabe. Um, you mentioned that coming out of the recession, Illinois' wall of debt increased while California's wall of debt decreased. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what did California do right and what did Illinois do wrong? Well, that's what I was um, trying to describe with the uh, reduction of their spending baseline. They brought that down significantly in that one graphic. And at the same time, they uh, had higher revenues than had been forecast. And to a significant extent, for the first several years after Proposition 30 was in effect, they did utilize a lot of the revenue growth for uh, reversing the school deferrals. Those had gotten to over 10 billion, and there were a lot of people that felt like, um, you know, it, it was questionable whether the state would be able to reverse those school aid deferrals, but they have. They reversed all of them. And so, you know, they exercised um, good budget discipline in those years to do that, and uh, there have been limited additions to the, un, you know, the new commitments to the state spending baseline in those years. So it was basically um, improved budget management. And um, it was aided also, I would say, by Proposition 25, which the voters passed in November of 2010. That allowed the legislature to pass budgets with a majority vote as opposed to the prior two-thirds um, vote, which uh, had contributed to recurring late budget adoption. And so since that time, the state has been able to always begin a fiscal year with its budget in place. Even when in 2012 and 2013, it was still facing large projected deficits, it was still able to come to an agreement before the new fiscal year began. And we think that was also um, helpful because that had contributed to less than optimal budget practices in our view. Uh, kudos to California for working down a wall of debt. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't make a dent in the mountain of debt standing behind the wall, which is the pension and uh, health care, retiree health care uh, debt. We'll talk about that later. This uh, stabilization account, have you done any stress testing to figure out how long that stabilization account will carry the state in a moderate recession or even a minor recession? You know, what's the glide path? Uh, and should Prop 2 be doubled or tripled or quadrupled in terms of what the money we put in in the good years? So the state has obviously more than just budget reserves to address uh, a shortfall in response to a recession. Um, mm. This is pretty complicated, so I'm going to try to give like a most high-level description as I can. But the shortfall that results um, in a recession is a, obviously a combination of two factors. It's your revenue shortfall and then the sort of net effect of automatic adjustments to expenditures. So in California, Proposition 98 and Proposition 2 both um, automatically change school and community college funding and then also debt and reserve deposits in response to a recession. I say that because if you see, say, a revenue shortfall of about $40, $80 billion, you can expect those formula-driven adjustments to offset roughly half of it. So um, in the past three recessions, we've seen budget shortfalls ranging anywhere from roughly, in inflation adjustment terms, you know, 40-ish, 50-ish billion in the early 1990s to over 100 billion um, in the most recent recession. Then if you say a moderate recession would be somewhere in between, really, really illustrative figures here, um, say, you know, $80 billion is a moderate recession, and then your automatic adjustments offset roughly half of that, so you're looking at a $40 billion budget hole. Um, the proposed level would cover, the proposed level this year of about $16 billion would obviously cover, you know, a third to a half of that. Let me, let me ask a follow-up question to that, um, which is not so much what happens in a recession, but what happens in a boom. Uh, these kinds of um, programs, uh, rainy day funds, uh, other prudent measures to put money aside, um, often come under uh, pressure uh, when they run for a while and nothing bad happens. Um, it, it, do, do any of you have a sense of how viable this kind of a, uh, approach is for California? That is, whether there'll be pressure on the legislature to, uh, to try to go around it or repeal it uh, to spend money more, current, more money currently when it looks like times are flush. I just 
even absent the rainy day fund, there's going to be pressure on this next governor to, to because the current governor has been saying no so consistently to the majority party, who I suspect will be the same party of the governor, um, to just simply spend more. I don't know if you want to speak to what happens when the rainy day fund's fully funded. You can do that far better um, than I, yeah. which I find interesting and, and maybe mitigate some of that. Right. So um, the rainy day fund is capped at 10% of general fund tax revenue. Um, the, under the administration's current budget proposals, uh, the state would actually reach that level in the 2018-19 budget. Um, when the state reaches the 10% cap under Proposition 2, then the amounts that would have been dedicated to the rainy day fund um, actually are spent on infrastructure. I think we had a question. To go back to uh, volatility of revenue, it seems like the, there's a, a, a factor that isn't counted uh, when you look at just tax mm -hmm. revenue alone. Um, if you take CalPERS and CalSTRS, um, th their revenues uh, are, are quite volatile also because they're, they're total, they're, their endowments are pegged to the market. So you have, uh, you have the double effect of, uh, of tax revenue being extremely volatile and pension fund revenue, non, not the, contributor, the contributory part, but the market part of pension fund revenue also being very volatile. And uh, I know that some of the pension funds have moved to reduce, the, to, to, reduce to de risk their, their portfolios, but this takes time. And if, if liquidity dries up and the market, uh, and the market falls, Everybody gets hurt anyway. So, how do you how do you uh, consider this in looking at in, in looking at state revenue? Um, so, obviously, pressures from um, pension expenditures are yet another um, uh, spending pressure that the state faces and can be exacerbated, as you noted, um, in a recession. This would happen particularly if market losses resulted in the pensions moving again to lower their discount rates. Um, as you noted, they've moved, both CalSTRS and CalPERS have mo moved to lower discount rates to 7%. Um, so that, I think our office would generally just think of these as, you know, an additional risk that the state faces in a recession. One thing we've observed is that if you look at the pension systems across the state in this long period of low interest rates that we've been in, they have um, migrated to riskier asset allocations. And so in the past five years, their um, asset allocations to equities and alternative investments has increased by 8%. Obviously, in a, either you know because the market is just, um, if you don't rebalance, that's what happens. But all, it could also be that they are trying to offset the low returns they're getting from fixed income, which are safer. So there's um, that risk in California, kind of um, the role of the financial markets is outsized, both on the revenue and their expenditures pre uh, pressures. Well, I think we've uh, reached the end of our allotted time. So uh, I'm afraid I'll have to call an end to this very interesting panel. Uh, Anne, Patrick, and Gabe, uh, thank you very much for your comments. <laughs>